I told the guest master I'd like to become a monk. What kind of monk, he asked. A real monk? Yes, I said. He poured me a cup of wine. Here, take this. No sooner had I drunk it than I became aware of a crystal globe forming around me. It began to expand, and finally it surrounded him too. This monk who a minute before had seemed so commonplace now took on an astonishing beauty. I was struck dumb. After a bit of thought, after a bit the thought came to me, Maybe I should tell him how beautiful he is. Perhaps he doesn't even know. But I really was dumb. That wine had burned out my tongue. And so great was my happiness at the sight of such beauty that I thought it was well worth the price of my tongue. When he made me a sign to leave, I turned away confident that the memory of that beauty would be a joy with me forever. But what was my surprise when I found that with each person I met, it was the same. As soon as she or he would pass unwittingly into my crystal globe, I could see their beauty too, and I knew it was real. Is this what it means to be a real monk, to see the beauty in others, and to be silent? Please let us take a few moments to either remain silent, if that's the right thing for you in this moment, or to turn to a neighbor and tell them something about your life for which you are profoundly grateful. And maybe share a name as well, probably your own. Please let's chant together the Buddha's words on loving kindness. If you don't, if, is there anyone who, one who doesn't have a copy who can't share with someone close by? Okay. This is the single most popular, most revered teaching of the Buddha the Sutra on Loving-Kindness. Now let us chant the Buddha's words on loving-kindness. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows
knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding by not holding to fixed views the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. When asked about his religion, the Dalai Lama says, my religion is kindness. When I asked my teacher Krishna in India 32 years ago, how will I know if my practice is succeeding? And she said with no hesitation, well, you will be becoming more loving. So our task is really simple, isn't it? It's to be loving in this moment as best we can, because this is the only moment we have. And how we are in this moment conditions the next moment, and so we create for ourselves a life which has more and more love in it, therefore more and more happiness. So let's sit together, mostly quiet, 
in the practice of love, and in love there's room for everything. So we will notice, if you're seeing, there's seeing. If the body is touching the floor or a cushion or a chair, notice that, making room for that. Anytime awareness is with the body, it's in the present moment. It can also be in the present moment with thoughts and emotions, but it's more challenging. We tend to get caught, get lost in emotion and thought. So notice that your body's here, it's breathing. Notice that your hands are alive and you can know it directly. The mind is remarkably trainable. It's been profoundly conditioned already by our childhoods and the conditioning forces of others, of media, life experiences. At a certain point in our lives, if we're very fortunate, we discover that we have evoked. We have an influence upon our destiny. And as taught by the Buddha, one of the most powerful things we can possibly do to influence our destiny is to be mindful, to be awake, to notice what's happening in the mind, to notice what's happening when we act with our body and speech. There's a not too helpful misunderstanding that it's actually worse than not too helpful, it's very destructive. A belief that we create the reality of this moment as though our mind were in charge of that. How we create our reality is to be mindful in this moment which conditions the next, which conditions the next. Also, if we perceive the moment clearly without fantasy, without projection, we live in a different reality than if we're lost in ideology or fear or desire. So please come home to yourself, to your body, to breathing. Notice when the mind is lost in wandering. And then with greatest gentleness, come home to breathing in and breathing out. No violence at all, no coercion even. And we can notice that each breath has a beginning, a lifetime, and then an ending. And so we become intimate with life, intimate with this breath.
if you are new to practice, please don't be alarmed if you discover a mind which is way more out of control than you ever imagined. If human minds weren't out of control, the world of humans wouldn't be as it is. If human minds were universally observed and moderated, if the hate were contained and the love were expressed, we would live in a different world. So this is a profound, loving, in a way, evolutionary and revolutionary moment for each of us. We are taking responsibility for this mind. And to work with it, we have to have a, an accurate diagnosis. And once we can see how it is, then we can work to become even more awake, more conscious, more attentive, more sensitive, more loving. It's remarkable how such profound exploration can occur simply by making the intention to stay at home with this breath.
in practicing mindfulness. There are many objects of awareness, the body, the interaction of the sense doors with their sense objects, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, feeling, and the mind interacting or arising with thoughts. There's liking and disliking. There are all the various personality stories that tell themselves. There's self and other criticism. These are all worthy of close examination. Let us also be aware of the mysterious awareness that notices, that is awake, that which knows. So it's not just the sensations of the body breathing in and out. There is a miraculous knowing of that. And a sort of knowing of that knowing, aware of being aware. Mindfulness is sometimes described as non judgmental awareness. warm hearted awareness of that which occurs inside us and around us in successive moments of consciousness. That which is aware.
I wish each of you could be sitting right here. to see the beauty of our gathered faces. Human beings who are willing, able, to stop and look inward, to stop and be the universe awakening to itself. In fact, I invite you, be aware of seeing right now, the fact of seeing. And then to the degree that it's comfortable, take a moment to just turn around and make eye contact with someone or someone's. Stay aware of seeing. Awareness meets awareness. Nothing to take or to give. How could there be since there's only one of us? Well, Mr. Jim, would you be so kind as to lead our oneness in some movement. For some mysterious reason, I woke up this morning with the Metta Sutra in my head, just rolling around. <coughs> so I said, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness. I've been saying that for 25 years. The standing I can handle. It's always free from drowsiness. So... <coughs> One should sustain this recollection of standing when you're standing. Being still, standing, is very difficult. We need to breathe. That makes something other than stillness. Just a tiny little dance that we do as our lungs expand Collarbone rises, ribs pull away from the spine, ribs pull away from the sternum. A little subtle, but it's not stillness, it's something else. So can we be aware of standing? Standing in contact with the floor, which is in contact with the earth. Can we sustain this recollection of a body that's changing? Changing with this breath.
changing with the next breath. Sinking. Lifting. And sinking. Sustaining the recollection of change. How many movements are there in a lifting? How many movements in letting go? Lifting. Changing movements, letting go. This time lifting and opening. Millions of nerves firing. We can track this whole lifting process. We know it here, we know it here, we know it here. Opening. Coming back, sustaining the recollection of anicca, change. Lifting again, but overhead. Letting go to one side. Lifting. There's no attachment to these movements. The change is totally accepted. It actually feels good in the body. Where's the ego attaching? seems to be fading away. And lifting up, separating clouds, holding a thought, an image, and then it fades away. Lifting, Turning, separating clouds, we might see an image, and then it fades away. No holding on. Just rising and fading. Opening to the side, pulling, pulling in, pressing out. How many movements are there in the wrist, in the elbow, in the shoulder, in the hips, in the toes? Can we sustain the recollection of change? Dropping, pulling back, coming overhead, and letting go. And then lifting across, feeling the weight into one leg, feeling change as it dissipates. 
get centered. We lift the other side. Feel the weight. Release. It's all change. turning to gaze at the moon. An image arises and then it fades. Another image. Pressing across, weight shifting, toes changing, sometimes they're working, sometimes they're resting, just allowing this movement to carry up from the toes and ankles, hips, shoulders, fingertips. It's all one body in one movement full of change, changing perception. <coughs> Reaching across and focusing now on the palm. How does it feel to focus? And turn and then drop that focus and create a new one. changing patterns of light on the palm of your hand. It's not my hand. It's a hand changing, absorbing shadows, light, shadows, light. And then releasing that gesture, taking a full breath, stepping, exhaling, rising back, and inhale. Breathing as one. Riding the waves, breathing out, breathing in. Opening the arms, coming forward. Turning the wrists, how many movements does it take to breathe out, to breathe in? And then turning back to the center, pausing, feeling both hands, the end of the arms, both shoulders, releasing the arms into gravity. And 
then stepping to the other side. Breathing out. And in. Riding the waves, breathing in and out. Opening, turning. And coming back to the center. Again, tuning in to the still body, the almost still body. How many perceptions of tingling, of breath, of warmth, coolness, sounds, Perceptions all around us, all within us, uh, interpenetrating this whole experience. Sinking, feeling the knees give way to gravity, rising and extending the fist. Sinking, feeling agency. I can't control much, but I can lift, but I can release. like a dragon rising from the waves, like a storm blowing in. Agency. Nature just being nature. Flying on the winds. Maybe an image arises. More storms blowing through, waving the branches of the trees. Changing direction, new election. back to the center. Balance, equilibrium. This is a body standing. This is a body lifting one arm and one knee. Panic? No. I can balance over here. I can balance over here. The body has this inner sense of equilibrium. How about the emotions? All right, breathing in. And back to stillness, noticing how close to stillness we can get. Bringing the hands together in gratitude for our time together, practicing, moving into deeper awareness of Anicca. Thank you. Mm, we probably need to open the windows.
Good morning, everybody. Hi. You guys really warmed it up in here. My name is Kate, and for those of you, how many of you who have never been here before? Yeah, a couple people. Well, welcome. This is what we do on Sunday morning. Robert's right. This is the best seat in the world. So glad you're all here. So, as you know, we've got a lot going on. You can see just by the number of people who are here now. We're hoping to redo the loft very soon upstairs, as soon as, as, soon as the board approves it, with some carpet and some chairs so that we'll be a little less squished, contained in this room. There are often a hundred people or more here on Sunday. And every one of you are incredibly welcome. If you want to be on our contact list, there's a, a tag board on the back, in the back of the room on the table. And just fill out your information and tell us whether or not we can share your name with other community members. We wouldn't share it with anyone else. And whether you want to re receive announcements. If you want to be part of our uh, listserv, our communications, where you guys can talk to each other, that's called Connections and you can sign up on the website. And again, that's not shared with anybody. You just, uh, you just get to chat with each other and hear each other's suggestions and ideas and thoughts. Um, the website does have an enormous amount of information. Our schedule is kept quite current. It's called portlandinsight.org. My contact information is there, and Roberts and Ruth are volunteer, uh, volunteer coordinators. So there's lots of information there, and we do keep it up. Ruth, do you want to talk a little bit? This is Ruth, and along with Kirsten, she is now doing the volunteer coordination, and I love her. Awesome. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, we have a couple of key volunteer slots that we are in need of someone to fill. Um, first off, uh, vacuuming the Dharma Hall. Um, Brooks has done a yeoman's job of helping to keep the Dharma Hall spotless and beautiful, and it's time for that to pass on to another person. So if you think you can spare the time, and this is something that appeals to you as a way to kind of support each other, um, I'm going to refer you to Melanie, who coordinates all of the housekeeping here and does an absolutely fabulous job of keeping this place perfect. Um, second request is Miss Kate is looking for someone to give her a hand on Tuesdays preparing the bank deposit. So as our weekly donations roll in, she's looking for somebody to just spend an hour to 90 minutes on Tuesday. Tuesday Tuesdays or Wednesday would work as well. To come in and help and learn how to do that and just sort of take that off her plate. So if that's something that you really feel called to do and you can fit it into your schedule, drop Kate a line. Um, you can also contact me if you want. A good way to do that is through the web form, I think. Mm -hmm. It's working now. So um, thank you. Thank you for considering it. Thank you, Ruth. Whew, what a relief. <laughs> um, we also have, uh, we have our regular Sunday morning activities, but if you haven't done it before, we have hospitality following Robert's Dharma Talk at noon. And so if you want to, and we have lots of stuff today brought in and left over from Thanksgiving. <laughs> we have post-Thanksgiving bounty. So please walk through that door right there and come and meet your uh, cohorts on the path. And I uh, have a bite to eat and a cup of coffee or some tea with us. We'd love that. Does anybody have anything else that I need? To oh, Dharma consults. Jim is doing Dharma consults today. So if you have questions about anything uh, that's uh, hanging out on your path and you want to talk to Jim, there's a sign-up sheet at the back of the room for after the Dharma talk. Anything? Robert.
This is the uh, first time, actually, I've ever worn this vestment, I guess it would be. Ruth Dennison gave it to me at the time of my wedding. And uh, I've had it in my office in a decorative sort of way. But uh, somehow or another, due to complex causes, it seemed like the right thing to do to wear it today. It belonged to her husband, Henry. I have a poem or two I want to share with you. Which order, which order? I think the other order. It's a poem by Ellen Bass which happens to have been written about Portland Airport. Gate C-22. How many of you know C-22? I know C-22. <laughs> At gate C-22 in the Portland Airport, a man in a broad band leather hat kissed a woman arriving from Orange County. They kissed and kissed and kissed. Long after the other passengers clicked their handles of their carry-ons and wheeled briskly towards short-term parking, that couple stood there, arms wrapped around each other, like he had just staggered off the boat at Ellis Island, like she'd been released at last from the ICU, snapped out of a coma, survived bone cancer, made it down from Annapurna in only the clothes she was wearing. Neither of them was young. His beard was gray. She carried a few extra pounds you could imagine her saying she had to lose. But they kissed lavish kisses like the ocean in the early morning, the way it gathers and swells, sucking each rock under, swallowing it again and again. We were all watching. Passengers waiting for the delayed flight to San Jose, the stewardesses, the pilots, the aproned woman icing Cinnabons, the man selling sunglasses. We just couldn't look away. We could taste those kisses crushed into our mouths. But the best part was his face. When he drew back and looked at her, his smile soft with wonder, almost as though he were a mother still open from giving birth, as your mother must have looked at you, no matter what happened after, if she beat you or left you or you're lonely now, you once lay there, the vernix not yet wiped off, and someone gazed at you as if you were the first sunrise seen on earth. The whole wing of the airport hushed, all of us trying to slip into that middle-aged woman's body, her plaid Bermuda shorts, Sl sun sleeveless blouse, glasses, little gold hoop earrings, tilting our heads up. But the best part was his face. When he drew back and looked at her, his smile soft with wonder, almost as though he were a mother still open from she he were a mother still open from giving birth. As your mother must have looked at you, no matter what happened after, if she beat you or left you or you're lonely now, you once lay there, the vernix not yet wiped off, and someone gazed at you as if you were the first sunrise seen from the earth. The whole wing of the airport hushed, all of us trying to slip into that woman's middle-aged body, her plaid Bermuda shorts, sleeveless blouse, glasses, little gold hoop earrings, tilting our heads up. Mm. 
mindfulness, non judgmental, warm hearted awareness of that which occurs in us and around us in successive moments of consciousness. Awareness can have, awareness can be used for some pretty bad things. It can be used also for the most exquisite undertaking of human possibility, which is waking up and becoming more loving. It's only been in the last, <laughs> it's funny to talk like this, it's only been in the last decade or so <laughs> that I've, uh, that the definition of mindfulness has had this caveat of warm-hearted because, or as I've come to realize, that there's no difference between metta, uh, loving-kindness practice, or insight practice, in fact, at least when they ripen, because when there's room for everything, then there's ease of presence. Oh, lest I forget, it's also my job to, to point out that there's a, there's a monk's bowl at the back of the room which will happily receive any offerings you'd like to make. PIMC operates on the basis of your generosity. And your awakening operates on the basis of your generosity as well. <laughs> because the more we do this, the more we move in the direction of reality. Because how could this or anything else be mine when I'm only here for a few eye blinks? That whole notion of mine is really insane. Now, of course, we have to have some stuff, and blah, blah, blah. But, but uh, so I encourage you, if PIMC helps you lift your heart and open and become more happy and loving, then make it part of your generosity practice. And you can do it online and do a monthly donation. Uh, and also we have our annual fundraising happening. I haven't heard how we're doing with that, but we have a goal of $10,000. And uh, by, Janu by January 1st. So if, if when it comes to your end of year giving, you'd like to uh, make a donation in that direction, there's uh, we'll send out the form, the, the app, What's it called? The announcement again. And uh, <laughs> on Wednesday this week, uh, Jennifer, my wife, and I are signing our wills. And uh, it's interesting how complicated it gets when you have stepchildren. And we've, we've had this, it's <laughs> this giant thing. But uh, one thing to remember also, just in case you should die someday, uh, you can also make a post-death gift to places of your choice, and this could be one of them. So, back here. If we're going to have room for everything in ourselves, there's a lot to accept, isn't there? If we're going to have room for everything in the world, there's even more to accept. There's a question that often arises, almost always, around, well, if I accept everything, won't I then be an accomplice to all the bad things that happen? If I accept my own doing bad things and my, the, for instance, violence right in front of me, do I have any responsibility to do something about that? And it's really useful, I think, to clarify that the, this 
emphasis on accepting things as they really are and accepting this moment as it really is pertains particularly to one's inner life. If we're, let's, and it's clear, it's the experiment is cleanest in meditation. So I'm sitting in meditation and thoughts of hatred arise. In fact, what option do I have other than to accept that this organism, this being, is experiencing hatred. I could say, unconsciously, usually, well, no, that can't be true, that can't be true, I don't, I don't have that. And then it would have to go somewhere, and then I'd have to see it in someone outside. It's an ego defense called projection. Uh, this is a particularly poignant one for me because uh, I was raised in such a way that I didn't, I wasn't, I couldn't allow myself to be angry. It was so ego dystonic. My view of myself was not that I was a person that ever got angry. Now, everyone around me knew that I was angry. I got angry, but I didn't know. But I saw angry people in the world, mostly men. Um, and I was in my 20s when, thanks to meditation, and then ultimately I got into therapy, uh, I, st I realized how much anger there was. Now, when I did my first meditation retreat in Bodh Gaya in India, I was traveling with my girlfriend of many years. We were planning to separate when we got home. And I so I did this 10-day meditation course, and then we traveled for another two or three months down to Sri Lanka. And, and we were in Goa. And we, we had uh, what I later came to understand was a fight. <laughs> and something went off inside me and I left, and, and the, the, the streets were, I don't know what it's like there now, but the streets were very narrow, it's, they were paved, but, and I walked for maybe two or three hours under a full moon in Goa, a beautiful spot, absolutely in complete inner chaos. I had no idea what was going on. I knew there was a storm happening, but I didn't, I didn't know what it was. And then it passed, and then I went back, and it was some years later that I realized that what was happening was a, ra a storm of rage and lots of enemy imaging. And uh, fortunately, I w had been trained enough that I didn't act it out. But that certainly is where spousal abuse comes from and a, a lot of the cr craziness uh, that we perpetrate on the world because we're completely unconscious of what's happening. Another story that um, is, is illustrative of this. This was, when was this? This was later. <laughs> Three years after that one, I was on a meditation retreat and a small retreat center, and I woke up one morning and went to breakfast, and you, I, they didn't have any yogurt. I mean, could you imagine that? They had no yogurt. And so I had a certain feeling about it, and I spoke to one of the manager people, young. It was a very tiny little place. And he took me out in the, in the, the backyard and said, Robert, um, you know, people who are as smiling and nice as you are all the time often are riddled with rage. And something ha the storm happened. I had no idea what it was. But... I couldn't go do anything to get away from it because I was doing, at that point, it was 14 or so hours of sitting and walking meditation a day. So it <laughs> And one final story of rage. I was, uh, it was in 1969. I was in India again, practicing as a monk for a little while. And there was a, uh, the place that I was practicing was a, um, 
a place where pilgrims stayed that were, had come to the Mahabodhi temple in Bodh Gaya, where the Buddha woke up. And there was a well with a chain link, a chain, and they got water at the well every day. And it was very quaint and beautiful and so on. And, and, but two weeks, three weeks, maybe a month into this retreat, one day they were pulling up the chain and all of a sudden I realized how absolutely irritating it was and how much I hated them before disturbing my meditation. And I watched, I was sitting, I never moved. I sat on my, I was actually under my mosquito net in my little stone house. And I sat there and watched as this horrid set of images arose. Uh, an image of assaulting them with a machete and a, a machine gun. And I've never, I've, uh, that's not true. I actually held an AR-14 last winter. We were staying with some people and the, the fellow had ordered one of these to defend himself. So I held one of those killing machines, quite something. But anyway, at that point, I never even held one. And so there was, there was this wild man that killed them all and pushed them down the well. All of this happening while I was sitting in meditation with kind of like, with this, what? And then acceptance. And th then my temperature spiked and I soaked my bed, just dripping with sweat. And the thought was there, I wish I had a thermometer. It's like, I'd like to know how hot this is getting me. And then it passed. And on its heels came a great wave of loving kindness and compassion for the human condition. Because I realized that this is in us. This is, this is part of what's in us as human beings. And so to practice mindfulness and acceptance is to accept that which arises. It isn't then to allow it to act upon itself. Either to act upon itself in further thought or in further emotional up uproar, or certainly not in acting out physically or verbally. I got pretty interested in this practice that we have this ego defensive projection and um, my my uh, my operating hypothesis for for my own w purposes on my own teaching and therapy is is actually a synthesis of Buddhist psychology and Jungian depth psychology. And I did some a Jungian weekend one time on the practice of the, the phenomenon of projection. And uh, I realized that projection happens individually and collectively and really collectively like we can as nations we project our dark side on others as uh, and and one of the one of the exercises that he had us do that weekend was to write down who in the world at, or in our lives we think of as them who is them who is it that their behavior disgusts us or that we feel righteously indignant about and he had to spend some time writing all that down. And then for the rest of the two days, as I recall, we examined how is that, how are the characteristics about that person around whom I feel righteously indignant, how are they my unconscious self? So if we are to practice meditation beyond stress management and beyond some basic relaxation and mm, beyond helping ourselves to become somewhat more psychologically functional, if we're actually going to meditate and encounter our deeper impulses. We'll encounter the dark side of ourselves. We'll also encounter 
the bright, brilliant, loving, compassionate, joyful side of ourselves. But they come as a, they come as a piece. They're part of one fabric. I've become, I think one might say obsessed, but deeply attentive to the uh, circumstances that are happening at Standing Rock, where the native people are, and their allies are standing to try to stop the pipeline. And, um, The video coming out of that circumstance is quite profound in that there are silent people standing on the burial sites of their ancestors and they are facing militarized police who are, uh, I think one could say attacking. And so there's a, um, an alliance between the oil companies and the police and, and there's this other world of people who, who are saying, we are the land and also we are you. We are one people. And what prompted me to speak about the shadow this morning is it's so easy to see the militarized police as bad people, as the enemy, or the governor of North Dakota as the enemy, or, and that's the same problem. <laughs> right? Whenever we're creating an enemy, we have created